I was trying to get upgrade my uh, my virtual machine and uh, my Windows virtual machine to Windows 8 because a <clears throat> client of mine is on it and wanted I don't know wanted testing. It doesn't matter. Freaking browsers right. are browsers. Yeah. So you know, as I told you, the, the desktop that I have right now is a Mac Mini, and it's like, how do you insert an optical disc in there? <laughs> yes. Right. So, um, so you know, being an <clears throat> Apple guy, I get on Apple's site and I go, oh, I'll get a Super Drive, and it's like, it's freaking. Seventy-five bucks, right? Exactly. But it's aluminum and it looks great. So, <laughs> or you could go to like Fry's and get like a seven-dollar DVD enclosure. So this is what I got: <laughs> little Amazon Basics. You know, it has this like little like little drawer here that pops out. <laughs> you remember when things had those? You're like, holy crap! Exactly. And, and like, it's also got you know, it's USB powered, but <laughs> <laughs> you need the two. It's like really. <laughs> I know that's awesome. I have an external hard drive that's exactly the same way. It's like you're plugging it's eight like, different things in there to try and get power, and it, it, right. You need like a hub for your hub. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. It's brutal because uh, I mean the only thing I use that little external hard drive for is with my MacBook Air, which has two <laughs> USB ports on it, and it, it draws do? power, so you can't just like run it off one to a hub or so. <laughs> You're supposed to use the lightning thunderbolt dock stuff Dude, with the um, yeah. thousand dollar monitor. <clears throat> yes, if What's only. Wrong? <laughs> and then, then I needed a USB uh, memory stick, a 16 gig, because I had to put some big stuff on it. So I went down to Walgreens because that's where you buy <laughs> memory yeah, sticks. Yeah, exactly. And they had this like it was on sale for like 14 bucks. It's PNY, but it's so freaking small. <laughs> it's like. Like, exactly. It's like how do I how do I get that shit in there? It's like right, exactly. It's like my fingers, and then they give you this little this little other thing that you're supposed to, I guess, clip this onto here. <laughs> and like, look, I was like, I've, it's a fingers. freaking earring, James. That's what you're missing. <laughs> totally. You got it in the jewelry happened? aisle. I was actually angry. You remember, uh, 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 OpenShift gave us those cool little yeah. And I was like, but that's only like eight gigs. I I needed I need on Steve. Be like, it's like what up? Twelve bucks for this thing. Whatever. It's like yes. you use it once and throw it away. <laughs> it's a single use USB drive. Sixteen gigabytes. Yet, like yeah. you know, my son's Xbox has like four gigabytes, and add something to that, it's like five hundred dollars. Right, of course, it's because no. they can. It's totally the rule there, right? It's a business model, right? Yep. <laughs> so, how you doing? I'm doing well. Doing yeah. very well. I'm trying you to watch are... the. Uh, you, what you need to do with your your uh, uh, IRC chat and geezer is make it big on your on your website. So I'm trying I... to watch the IRC, but you know, I know you're cool. You've got an IRC client, right? Well, yeah, because that's well, you're on Windows, and there's not very good. Windows and, and, and I know there's a micro IRC, but uh, my evaluation ran out. So, <laughs> you think there's much of a market for shareware IRC clients these days? I, yeah, probably not. It's right. like uh, people, what are those? Who, people who use it are like, dude, I've got a shell script or you know some <laughs> sort of low-level socket thing that they've connected up. It's like the uh, what is it? The Usenet clients. Remember those things? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think I'm gonna make one. It's actually these days, right? An RSS client. <laughs> Who uses one of those anymore? <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> shortly. Oh, really? Well. You're big. You're a big no. RSS guy these days. Uh, you know, I actually what I use is Flipboard, and Flipboard was consuming um my Google Reader stuff, mm -hmm. and so that was okay. Um, but they've kind of changed their stuff over because you could also star stuff and it would go into your Google uh, Google Reader favorite starring system. So if you start something one place, it would show up over there, which was kind of nice. But then they introduced this whole, uh, you can basically create your own magazine now in Flipboard. So I've taken to using that, which I, I don't know, that's convenient for me. So if I were to subscribe to the Dave Bowman magazine in Flipboard, what might I be? <laughs> what might I be watching? <laughs> well, I've got two of them. I think are public. One is called JavaScripty, and the other one's GeoDeveloper. And so just whenever I, you know, all the different feeds come in through Flipboard, um, a lot of it's through Twitter, but a lot of it's through other stuff too. 
and I can just like uh, plus it into one of these other magazines so that instead of just trolling through my infinite list of uh, you know Twitter favorites which contain everything from silly cat photos to um, you know that dude who did uh, what is it thing called D map or map D the thing that's 700,000 times faster than uh, oh, yeah. a possibly not optimally tuned post just um, <laughs> Yeah, MapD is what it's called. Um, but, you know, I mean, everything's in my Twitter favorites. So this allows me to kind of seg segment it out and be like, okay, I got to catch up on my JavaScript stuff, so I'll dig through that magazine. <clears throat> but, yeah, I mean, apparently there are people reading it, which surprised me because I got into some section of Flipboard and it was like nine subscribers. Damn. <laughs> is there pressure now? You have, you feel like you have your customers? and you... I know. I got to keep up the good work of... Book Otherwise, they'll go somewhere else. That, exactly. I'd feel bad about that. Yeah, it's almost like having a blog. <laughs> exactly. Remember when you used to blog? I did. I just did a big stint of blogging, but that was more like, oh, crap, I signed myself up to do a whole bunch of JavaScript. Yeah, you, was, can't, you, can't, do, you can't say you're going to have a series. Never say you have a blog series because that yeah. means you've got commitment. Just say, I'm just talking about this. And maybe <laughs> this is today's random thought. Right. It's like when I had a when I had a real job, <laughs> when I worked for the man, I used to have time to blog, and now right. that I have my own thing going, it's like, right. I, when you're do lucky. I have time to do anything? I'm sure you're lucky if you get out of the room to have dinner. Like, yeah, that's well, you know, I got to go all the way down that. There's a hallway there. I got to turn left. I, I got to turn yeah. right. And, right. You could get lost, and then your train of thoughts gone, and before you know it, you're on the couch with beer and Doritos and playing Xbox, right? Yeah, so it's like, why is there not a kegerator in here? That's what I want. <laughs> this is a problem. I could totally address that living by myself. You could. Well, that was depressing, though. <laughs> <laughs> I live by myself, I work by myself, and I got a kegerator in my office. Right, right. No who, drinking problem here. Who, who doesn't want to be part of that? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good scene. Oh, so. All right. I, right? So you, uh, you had this weird tweet this week, I guess, saying you were looking for GIS analysts that could be turned into developers? Did I, did yes. I read that right? Yes, you did. Um, so, yeah, this is part of this, um, you know, broader strategy, so we say, uh, which came from the fact that, you know, <clears throat> we're a consultancy, and our typical model is, like all consultancies, uh, when you need new staff, you wait until the very last possible moment. You squeeze everything out of your current staff that you possibly can until they're on the edge of exploding, and then you'd be like, okay, good, let's get one more person. But we need them two weeks ago, so we have to get the best person possible, um, <clears throat> which tends to mean you know you immediately have to go for extremely high-end resources, mm -hmm. which is okay, but you know then what you end up with is a team that's really top-heavy. Consulting goes up and down and up and down and up and down, and there's a lot of stuff that we, you know, do as consulting software developers that, you know, you don't need somebody with 15 years experience to do this. And so our question was, okay, well, how can we try and bring some people in <clears throat> to fill out our team? So we have senior resources, you know, junior, middle, whatever you want to call them, and then some kind of entry-level people. We did a couple of searches looking straight up like, yo, computer science guys straight out of school, why don't you come hang out with us and build maps? Uh, turned out those guys are more interested in why don't I try to get into Twitter or any other startup and, you know, go that route. <clears throat> so Jeff Germain had this idea of, hey, why don't we turn this around and say, uh, GIS people who are sick of making maps for the man and want to get into writing some code, we'll give you an opportunity to come in. And, uh, you know, we're not going to pay you a ton of money, but we are going to invest time into helping you come up to speed. This is going to be, uh, I mean, call it an internship, whatever, but it's kind of actually we're going to hire you, and our hope is to have you here several years. But the initial thing is a, it's a set up as an internship. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, put you through the, the loops, you know. You're going to learn how to write software, and then somewhere along the way there's going to be maps in here we are going to probably delegate a bunch of, you know, hey, look, our client sent us a whole bunch of data. It needs to be munged. It needs to get into SDE. It needs to be published. Go, right, with some mm -hmm. kind of whiteboardy type guidance. Go take it because you guys understand <clears throat> the geospatial stuff. And it's things that we as the senior developers, you know, probably shouldn't be spending our time mucking around with cartography a whole lot. 
But at the same time, we don't have so much work in that area that we can have a dedicated GIS person. So <clears throat> the idea was to just kind of open it up, say, hey, GIS analyst people who want to get out of that and, and change, change your line of business, let's see if you want to join us. And <clears throat> so our initial round of doing this was last fall. And we got, uh, at that point, we just wanted to do an experiment to see, okay, is this even going to work? And we put out a very small ad only for a few days, and we got a number of people, and it ended up working really well. We got a guy named Nick who joined us uh, coming up on six months ago now, and it's been fantastic. I think he's mm -hmm. had a really good time <clears throat> um, working with us. We've had a great time working with him. He's come up to speed really quickly. Uh, you know, and I think he you know, has the right attitude about it. It's like, you know, we're not going to pay you a ton of money, but you're going to get an incredible amount of experience. And then as you ramp up, you know, of course, you know, once you can uh, write yourself the back end of an MVC application, wire in some web APIs, you know what you're doing, building REST-based services, JSON is second nature. If I say get, put, post, delete, you immediately understand what I'm talking about. <clears throat> then, yeah, I mean, you'll move up the food chain and stuff. But uh, anyways, that's kind of what we're doing. And... Uh, Hopefully there's a bunch of people uh, tuning in here because at this point we have almost 100 people who've submitted resumes for this wow. uh, <clears throat> from all over the U.S., all over the uh, – one person from Australia, who I assume is an American, uh, or at least has a green card and the right to work here because we cannot sponsor uh, foreign nationals for this sort of a thing. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, it's, it's all manner of folks, so it should be pretty interesting. But I sent them all a, uh, a thing saying, hey, tune into this because we're going to have a conversation about this. And, uh, you know, the broader ideas about how we uh, bring more development into the whole. Um, so what's the, what's, the, what's the easy way to get started? Is it Python? Is it making simple JavaScript maps? Is it VBA? Is it? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, getting started on your own, I would say, you know, probably Python and look at that as, you know, and it's. I think a lot of GIS analysts are doing this, and almost everybody who sent in information to us was, you know, I'm using Python every day, automating my tasks, and I think that that's a really good start. Um, but I mean, what we're doing is we're not bringing you in to write Python geoprocessing scripts. It's about okay, <clears throat> start at the back end. Let's learn how web things work, and we're going to get you up to speed in C sharp teach you how an MVC application is structured. It's the same as if you're, you know, <clears throat> building something on Node with an MVC backend or you're building something on Rails or Django, whatever. It's the same pattern, so you get that experience. Um, and then we'll work on the front side. Once we've got a backend, uh, then we'll start working on the front side, and now it's going to be focused on, uh, you know, our weapons of choice, right? Uh, backbone Marionette, Esri JavaScript API for tablets and uh, full screen, uh, you know, big browsers, and then probably Leaflet on the mobile side. I mean, that's <clears throat> what we're going to be doing, but, you know, it's the whole, uh, I think, conundrum that is an industry. It's kind of facing uh, a bit of a problem, I think, with the education system. And I don't, you may have a bunch of experience and thoughts on this too, but you, you get all these schools that are pretty good at producing GIS analysts. Um, yeah. Button pushers. Somewhere between button pusher and creative thinker, right? But definitely with a, a slant towards we're teaching you how to press the buttons. Yeah. Um, as an individual, you may express some creativity and, uh, you know, kind of move forward in that direction. And hopefully that, you know, is more what, what the people were hoping apply for this. Um, <clears throat> but I think that that's, you know, as you know, greatly selling people short in terms of promising them a great career uh, but all you've learned is how to like click a series of buttons in ArcMap and haven't really got the the concepts of what you're trying to achieve here, <clears throat> and then that's going to be just a limiting thing over time. So yeah, no, it's it's interesting. The other thing I, I was talking to someone about was saying you get all these guys that understand Python, and then all of a sudden they get the world of curly braces and things like that. It's like it's a totally different world. You know they. You know, indents and things matter, and then all of a sudden they don't, and you got to close shit off. And it's 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 funny how you know, 
I guess we're maybe we're a little bit used to this kind of stuff, but the idea of it's so it's interesting to see you going I don't want to say backwards, but starting on the back end. <laughs> right. You know, saying, you know, to to start up a web app you need something in the back end to run the damn thing. This is how yeah. you do it. Exactly. I mean I think, you know, no doubt, you know, it's uh the way I think I want to conceive of this for the, the people we're bringing in is to literally, you know, start with building web apps. <clears throat> so start with the back end and don't start with Node because then you're going to get into all the async stuff and closures and callbacks. Start with something that's a little bit more um, closely aligned with Python, something that's procedural, right? In C Sharp, unless you're doing special stuff to make something be async, it's, you know, A, B, C, D. This is the order it executes, it drops at the bottom a page gets rendered. <clears throat> well, I think where you get into like curly braces and things start getting weird is when it's all async, right? And you're like, oh, I got this callback stack, but I need seven things to happen, but only six occur. And then it, you know, it, things just get really weird. Um, and, and that's definitely why you know, our approach is let's start at the back. Things are procedural. Let's explain to you how to store stuff in databases, manage stuff with object relational mappers, you know, get into like angle brackets that are being produced. Doesn't you know? It's a templating thing, right? That's all a web app is. It's logic that has data and dumps it into a template. So it's really the same. And Rails or Django or .NET, it's this is how web apps work. So let's get a good, good solid foundation there. Once we've got that understood, <clears throat> then we can work on the front side. That's where things are a lot more uh, free form. As, as you know, you know, you get into JavaScript and you know anything you want and yeah. uh, that can get you into the you know proverbial jQuery soup where hey look I just added this and then I added this and now I've added 500 things and it's totally unmanageable um, and it can also get you into a whole bunch of trouble when you start to you know get crafty about things but maybe not fully understand exactly what's going on and then you wonder why you know events are coming up at the wrong time and you forget like hey I developed this on a local area network, talking to a wicked fast server from my wicked fast Chrome, and then you go and separate that stuff and run it on IE6, <laughs> and stuff happens in the wrong order, and you're like, "Well, this is why, right?" Yeah. So, you know, we're, the web development stuff I think is is harder, and you can push it out. Um, yeah, I never really thought about it that way. It's it's almost as you say, it's the, the linear function of the back end. Things are much more simplistic. Um, you create something right. to do this. You don't, you know, when you create a web map, it does everything, right? You know, you got to plan for every right. conceivable click and stuff. Whereas you can, as you say, you could, you know, if I just needed something that I can call this database and return me lat long coordinates so I can place them on a map, that's right. Exactly. That's a that's a huge thing, and you know, it's about. <clears throat> I think the thing that we approach things from is let's build a high performance application, and that starts at the beginning. So points on map is what you just you know mentioned there. So most of the time for points, we don't store them in a spatial data format, right? It's a table with X, Ys, it's indexed, and it's wicked fast, and we can get them any way we want with any kind of quite, you know, crazy cryptic uh, query that we want, <clears throat> cluster them if we need to, and ship them down to the, to the client super fast. Mm -hmm. Or we can, you know, use ArcGIS server and put... Um, make an XY layer that runs off that same table, which is kind of a nice hybrid. It works really, really cleanly for points. Um, now, once you get into the you know, higher order geometries, it's eh, whatever. you got to send more complex geometry around. But uh, points itself is like a really simple thing. I think it's easy for everybody to understand. And, you know, why not bring people in and say, okay, you may have been taught to think about points as they have to be in a feature class or, you know, it's in a table with an XY or, you know, with a geometry, but let's say that's just going to add a whole bunch of overhead we don't need, right? So let's take it out. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's what I learned when I joined Wii U all those years ago. You know, they had this bounding boxes that just appeared just so quickly, and it's like, oh, they're just coordinates and right. indexed and... Fast. Why do I, I have a baseball <laughs> in my hand, I don't know why. But... Uh, <laughs> throw out the pitch here. <laughs> you know, it's... But that's a very good point is, you know, GIS people think, well, I need some sort of spatial database that understands topology and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And all I'm doing is drawing squares or points. It's like, <laughs> what right. the hell? What, you know, why are you doing all this stuff? So it, it's actually a good lesson for people. 
Right. Uh, to come yeah. at it and say, like, let's take our GIS goggles off and be like, well, how would you solve this problem if, you know, you didn't know GIS? And there's a lot of stuff that comes out of that, you know, from stuff as simple as it's not always about a map, right? And there's all this, <clears throat> these great posts that uh, Brian Timoney has been doing about, you know, ditch the portal, get rid of the big TOC and all this stuff. And I think that's just an important lesson as well, because um, if if there is any part of a geospatial curriculum where they are teaching you anything about doing web technology, it's dominantly like, yeah, take that map that you put in ArcMap and stick it in here. And it's like, hmm, it's exactly not it. And I will say, you know, like Mapbox, the, the folks who are getting into using CardoDB and Mapbox, <clears throat> that those tools themselves definitely force you into the, yeah, we don't really have a TOC and you probably shouldn't ask for one and let's build a focused map. And uh, so I think that's good, but it certainly doesn't seem to be a broad part of the uh, spectrum of what people are <clears throat> experimenting with or, or working with in the, the curriculums that we're seeing anyway. So No, in fact, I just, uh, someone sent me their resume because they're looking for a job and he was bragging about how he gets to use uh, our IMS still in college. It's like, Really? <laughs> I think you picked the wrong college. I don't remember which right. one it was. I don't. I should I'm embarrass him. So sorry about that. Yeah, so he's like, he's like, yeah. So I, this this Axel stuff. Do you get to use that with ArcGIS Server? And you're like, not so sorry. much. Yeah. <laughs> yes, parsing XML and JavaScript. I miss those days, though. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it was nice. There's some things that are still cool about it that are a pain in the butt now. I mean, one of the things right. you could I'm, you could you could just write some some send some XML back and change the map, and you could change the whole map, right? Because yeah. you, you didn't have a concept of a base map, it was nice because you could create these static maps. And so one of the things I'd like to see Esri add is um, something to ArcGIS Server, like a static maps API, kind of like Google has, where you yeah, can yeah. Why do they not have that? I, I don't know. I mean, I would... one of the things I may have some of these new people work on is building that for ArcGIS server um, because you can take a uh, via the SOAP API now this will Ooh. be exciting right <laughs> but that does give you the option to make a call to a map and it will crush everything in the map and you can send geometry to it which is going to be kind of useful for uh, one of the things we want to do for um, to build really really high functioning super performant um, kind of not I don't call it a dashboard. It's related to traffic and 511 systems. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the ideas we had is uh, we want to make sure that the initial page loads really fast, which means no heavy-duty JavaScript slippy maps in here, right? But I do want to show um, two images that show the current traffic speeds and then road conditions. Um, so what I want is basically the slippy map without all the slippy stuff. Just give me the actual crush down thing. And <clears throat> there's no option in the Esri stack to do that. And I certainly don't want to spin up two of those things when maybe, you know, that's not really what the person's into, right? It's just boom. Yeah, the, and those load, they're so much quicker to just write one simple map out and cut all those tiles. and. Oh, yeah, totally. You know, one thing, boom, it's out, you know. Um, and then if you want to dig into the damn map, yeah, click on the map or follow the little link, and then you get the full-blown loaded-up experience with all the other stuff. But you've made the choice to do that. You didn't show up at the website and wonder, why is it taking, you know, two minutes to load because it's pulling down 7,000 JavaScript files and a bunch of tiles and all kinds of other stuff, so... Yeah, and believe us, we were just talking about that earlier. You don't need to give Chrome and reason to... <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> to load. A, a memory hog, right? It doesn't I, need any encouragement. You know, I, uh, I was always thinking of authoring a dojo blocker uh, extension <laughs> for Chrome. <laughs> just to stop it downloading all that junk. Just, just block it. It just right? shows like a little image and just nicks it right out. You know, as you were saying, you know, you, you, I just want this simple map and it ends up loading freaking, you know, Right. 500k of, of of dojo just to show right. it. Right, and then, I mean, and that's like you know, just that's one of those things of uh, people's level of experience working with it. Right, it's very easy to get all require happy with uh, when you're building on dojo, and you just be like, yeah, well, let's bring in the layout and a bunch of toolbars and all this stuff. Um, 
without really realizing that, you know, if you turn on Chrome DevTools and you look at like how many requests are going out, you, without any effort, you're at a point where there's 150 requests flying around. And, you know, it's just kind of like, we can do better than that, guys. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, one of the interesting things, because you weren't at the Dev Summit or EPC, um, one of the things that's coming from Esri, which I think is a good move, is that they're going to have a uh, the ability to do a custom build of the JavaScript API. So Ooh. you go in and basically check it, check, 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 or there was some talk that they might actually, you give it the URL to your website and it will figure out the requires. I'm not really sure which direction they're going to go. Um, I mean, heck, either would be, just give me the checkboxes and let me do it. <clears throat> but then what it'll do is give, give you all that stuff, compressed and minified, and then you can go and inline it with the rest of your JavaScript so that you do are able to get to a spot where you have a single package download. Uh, that's all your JavaScript, that's all their JavaScript smashed together. So instead of having the super chatty thing we have right now, you can, uh, you can have one, one hit for your JavaScript, which would be pretty awesome. And then I think what you find, right, is that it's actually not that big. <clears throat> like if you get the compact, it's like 120k, which is a lot bigger than Leaflet, but it does a lot more. So, yeah. you know. um, but if it's coming down in one hit versus 60, that makes a huge difference to latency. It's going to make an enormous difference for anything that's mobile, right? I watched this awesome. Uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll tweet out the link to this, but a really good talk by this uh, Google engineer whose name I'll butcher. It's Ilya Grigoric or something like this. Um, and he's on the Chrome team and he was talking about um, the, the title of the talk is something like uh, 1,000 milliseconds to glass. And the idea there is that in order for people to think that your, you know, your web app is being responsive, you have pretty much about one second for every interaction. If you mm -hmm. get it, um, I think it's below 200. Or it seems instantaneous. Uh, once you get 200 milliseconds, once you get up to 1,000 milliseconds, much past that, people are going to start mentally switching. And beyond five milliseconds, which is five seconds, right, people bail. So the whole talk was you know, very interesting about how they do all these things and figure it all out. Um, but what I thought was really killer was the idea that on a cell network, <clears throat> You're, you know, you make a request, your phone makes a request, bingo, it goes up and around, bum, 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 bum. Mm -hmm. and at some point it pops off the cell provider's network onto the internet. <clears throat> that expanse of time can be up to 400 milliseconds. So if you are looking to say, I want my page to draw and have a reaction to my user in less than a second, almost half of that time is going to be consumed um, in the carrier's network before it even starts hopping around the web to get to you. So that's really an interesting thing. The other thing that he mentions that I thought was really cool was that carrier networks are optimized around um, conserving battery life and turning the radio off as fast as possible. And so his recommendation is that um, <clears throat> instead of making a whole bunch of really small requests, what you should do is try and make bigger single requests because there's all this latency involved in spinning up the radio. When you spin up the radio, it has to, you know, communicate with the network and there's all this handshaking and all this other shenanigans that goes on that wastes a bunch of time before you're actually starting to do useful stuff for mm -hmm. your end user. So um, I'll shoot that le link out because it was, I mean, if you're a web developer and you're doing anything with mobile, I thought this was really interesting. Um, it's funny you talk about milliseconds, but it's, but then again, it's, they, they add up so damn quickly. <laughs> well, that's, you know, if you're, I mean, even if you're kind of on average, if you get 200 milliseconds, now you're down to 800 milliseconds to do something useful for your user, which is transit the network, go run your query in a database, get the stuff back, package it up, shoot it back down. And this, you know, this happens for each one of the possible requests that are going on. So if you have, you know, uh, the Esri's compact version of their uh, JavaScript API, that's still making a ton of requests. I and mean, this is where this uh, custom build thing, I think, is going to make a huge difference. Yeah, that's interesting. Able... I mean, I'm just thinking about it. I, I didn't see the talk, and someone posted a, um, a link here. Link, I guess, in the IRC. I'll have to click on that. Yeah. But it's just, that's interesting. You know, that the idea that you can pull out everything that you need 
and nothing more. And right. maybe that solves some of the problems you say that you know, freaking dojo craziness and thousands of little files and right. You know, now you don't have to worry about that. You can still, I guess, theoretically leverage digits if you want. <laughs> wow, that, that's a whole other story, isn't it? Right? Yeah, we won't go, we won't go down that rabbit hole, but right. uh, you exactly. know, maybe it is a, a good way of solving that problem without having to re-architect the whole thing. And maybe you don't need to re-architect the whole thing. Well, I mean, that's what I would put forward, right? Dojo solves an awful lot of problems and it works really well for what you know the underlying thing is that Esri's trying to solve with their JavaScript API. It was out; it had all this SVG support, and you know, it it does the thing it needs to do, and it does it well. I think where you conflate their map control into this universe of digits is where, you know, yeah, it's great, and you can throw it together really quickly, but you know, expect it to fall apart. Um, and they don't have so much, and there are ways to do this, but definitely the digit paradigm, I mean, it's it's not far off of what you get when you get all jQuery on something, right? You end up with jQuery soup, and people are not necessarily offended by that, so I don't think you should be any more or less offended by digit soup. And this is where you, you end up with things like Backbone Marionette, and as you get mm -hmm. you know more opinionated, you get Ember and, and uh, um, Angular. Um, and a bunch of other frameworks in here, <clears throat> um, where they their whole goal is to say, look, you know, the soup is the problem. It's not about Dojo, and it's not about jQuery being issues. It's a, it's about the fact that those things are so unopinionated about how stuff should be connected that you just end up with this gray goop of of code in the middle. And when you get, you know, Backbone's pretty unopinionated. Marionette starts to get some opinions. You get further over into Ember and, and, and Angular, and now you have very strong opinions. And it's really yeah. opinions about how you're going to organize that code so that it's sane, you know. Um, and so I think that you know we're we're going a good big ramble here today. But I, yeah, no, it's well, it's funny you think about. I mean, we're picking on Dojo, so we'll just stay on picking on Dojo. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's an easy target. It's an easy target, but you know, there's. The flex, it, there's flexibility in how Dojo is laid out, right? Yeah. There's almost nothing you can't do in Dojo. And if you can't exactly. figure it out, chances are somebody already figured it out and you can copy and paste and away yeah. you go. Exactly. Um, when you start going these other routes where they're much more, um, I don't know, uh, svelte. <laughs> there's, you know, there's, there's less you can do. There's, there's actually aggravation in that as well. It's like, yeah. oh, crap. If, if I was in Dojo, I could do this in two seconds. You know, so how do you, right? How do you get around that stuff? And then, but I think that's what you were getting at. It makes your code a lot more, you know, a lot more, I don't know, just right on topic as opposed to all this junk you're loading. And um, you know, just, just the other day, I was, um, I was helping somebody out, and you know, they're asking me these questions about using ArcGIS Server, and I'm like, are you using Silverlight to access this stuff? And they're like. <laughs> Yeah, why? And you know, it's like cuz you just you're looking at this problem the whole wrong way. Right. You know, it's all you want to do is create a simple map to, to have people click and get information. And you know, I guess we went from picking on Dojo to picking on Silverlight. <laughs> but it's that's, like that's too easy of an target. Yeah, I know, nobody really. But then again, it's like, you know, there's flexibility in that. Oh, I don't know. I Yeah. I don't know if I would <clears throat> You know, you were, we were talking about, you know, you're, you're, you're basically creating developers from people that have somewhat of a knowledge of scripting, we'll call it, right? and have an understanding of how databases work and, mm -hmm. and understanding of uh, sort of waterfall and agile ways of, of developing, right. you know. So maybe that is just, you know, lends itself to the dojo types of environments where, you know, how do I pick? A little bit here, a little bit there, and and create something, you know, mashing it up. Yeah. Uh, versus, you know, you think of a kick-ass developer. They're like, I just start from a blank uh, notepad. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's and it's like VM we... all the time, baby. <laughs> Green screen. I don't. I don't need no windowing. Right. right. If I have a, there shouldn't be a menu at the top. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys. I mean, I think it's an interesting thing, right? Because there's this huge dichotomy in in. Uh, not so much in GIS, but somebody, uh, we were a whole bunch of Twitter stuff yesterday about this whole hiring GIS people thing, and somebody was kind of making the distinction between uh, geo and GIS. And so if you kind of conflate out of GIS up to this kind of bigger geo concept, 
you start to run into a <clears throat> kind of another species of developer that that is you know the dude with the MacBook rocking Vim and you know everything's in the cloud and this is all I know and I'm just using the simplest things that are possible. Not unlike the GIS person who's coming at it from the idea of, well, dude, there's digits. I'm going to throw this up. It's just that they have a very different kind of set of preconceived notions and understanding about how stuff works. I think that's that's a whole other little interesting angle on this because it's you know if we were to go out and hire uh, or try to hire you know the the MacBook Pro Vim dude. He have as much of a impedance mismatch showing up here as as if you know you took ArcMap 101. Welcome yeah. to developing. Uh, Here's Arc Objects. Have <laughs> exactly <Good luck>. right. <laughs> you know, you maybe have a lot of experience in uh, development, but you've really just scratched the surface if you haven't done Arc Objects. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> such a whole other thing. Yeah, we don't need to go down that hole. Thankfully, not uh, anything we need to deal with anymore. Right? I mean, I can't, you know, I kind of make fun of Arc Objects all the time because I used to do it, but I can't remember the last time I dealt with it. And the last time I had to deal with it, I just found Bill Dollins and I said, hey, can you help me out here? <laughs> I paid him to deal with it. <laughs> right, right. You can outsource it to the, the few folks. Very soon, Arc Objects developers are going to be on par with like COBOL people, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Those guys make a lot of money, too. I have an AS400 that needs to be serviced here. <laughs> exactly. Everybody else is like, ow. I don't, right? I don't you don't even know. need to take a shower. You can smell as bad as you want, and there. nobody can say a thing. Exactly. The bar is very low. <laughs> you know, Cobol, you're in. Yeah, totally. It. Yeah, well, yeah, it's fun it to get off of that, but my uh, ex-wife used to work for a company that had... Uh, you know, AS400 and all that stuff. And he, right. She would, I, one day we went for lunch and this guy showed up and he was, you know, this old guy with the beards and pocket protector with a calculator sticking out. I mean, the whole thing was just... <laughs> right, right. You're Perfect. totally like archetypal computer scientist from the mid-70s, right? Yeah. Like, and he, he like has a, no idea how to use like a cell phone. <laughs> exactly. He's got like a big page of the fan-fed paper. He's got his program all printed out with a, you know, not even what kind a dot. How do you matrix? think that guy drives? I think he drives like a, a 1983 <laughs> Golf, not a GTI, but a Golf. <laughs> right, exactly. Or maybe it's a Rabbit, but you know, it's like right. <laughs> extremely diesel, pragmatic. Got to be diesel, right? It does. Got to be diesel. This guy's always driving. Careful there, because I have a I have a Golf diesel myself. Wow, yeah. you're such a hipster. Well, it gets like 55 miles to the gallon, so. Yeah, I got the I, other I, problem. I, I run this... biodiesel, so, you know, I'm just that much of a nerd. I got I got this, I got a Volkswagen, too, and it's got this turbocharger in it. And it's like, people always say, that's awesome. I go, no, it's not awesome, because it's like, it's the, <laughs> it's got the gas, the fuel economy of a V8 when you accelerate. <laughs> right. When it's hot outside, turbos don't work. So in the summer, it's got the power of a, you know, a 90 horsepower. Right. Daihatsu, you know. <laughs> those like super small toaster trucks. Right. Ever wonder why they put intercoolers on cars? It's because like shit gets hot. And, right, right. You know, what's the hottest part of your car? All G on the engine. <laughs> right. Let's see what we can do about turning that down. Yeah, I know. Cool. Oh, well, you know, so, so what were you talking about? I don't know. Cobalt. We're all over the place. <laughs> yeah. Well. Cobalt to like, yeah. Okay, anybody who is listening who is applying for this, we will not be doing any COBOL, so just so you're aware. So one of the funniest, when I, when I, when I left and started my own company, one of, the, one of the most interesting emails I got was from this, this guy that I worked with early, mid, mid, mid-90s, and it was, right. uh, it was actually in Fort Co- not Fort Collins, uh, Colorado Springs, and uh, he was doing some work for the Air Force, and uh, we had done this old... Uh, arc grid type of thing where it analyzed grid and did this all stuff. And he's like, do you still know how to do Fortran? And I'm like, I didn't know how to do Fortran back then, but this guy's looking for an arc. If anybody out there knows arc, (laughs) it was Fortran and wants to do some old arc info. uh, (laughs) Right. Some really low level stuff with grid. This guy's got some project for you. (laughs) They had some SDK on top of like, uh, command line arc info had a whole other SDK thing that you could get access to. I think was, Fortran libraries, like more direct level access. You didn't have to do it through ARC or AML. I never, we never got into doing that. But No, I never I technically got in it either. My job was actually to create the grids, and then, and then these other smart guys did. Some smart dudes. 
Yeah, I think it was like I want to say University of Santa Barbara or you know one of those houses that we actually they think they did the fort. But I could you know that I can't find those emails from the mid nineties. It was oddly it was, it was pre Gmail, so. I, you know, to be honest with you, I think our email system was in VMS at the time. So, <laughs> so you had like a one megabyte limit in your mailbox. Yeah, totally. And you, you know, awesome. you, you use like some weird command line thing. You know, you'd hit yeah. down like Option Q. Um, you know, that that was send. It wasn't quit. It was send. Right. Because that will that will allow you to transition smoothly between VI and your email program. You probably would. The VI yeah. guys are probably like, yeah, give me yeah, some VMS. Totally. No, just weird, more weird bindings, please. That's what do we want? Weird yeah. bindings. Exclusive. They have, you know, Vim guys have fi their fingers are so dexterous. They can just type anywhere, and it's like, you know, I'm not that good. No, and anytime you have to grab your mouse or keypad, you're kind of like, like, right. Well, that's really? their aesthetic, right? Is they're like offended by by leaving the home keys. Like, I must be on the home keys at all times. Ah! But if you watch them, I mean, there's like some uh, Vim Cohens. Like the Ruby Cohen's, like the mm -hmm. practice stuff. Um, so there's people who do like put the videos on YouTube, and you watch them do this, and you're just like, "Wow, you're furious." Um, I have never seen one of these people in person, though, so I don't know if it's like there's two guys and they do a whole bunch of videos trying to like really sell Vim to everybody, and everyone else is just still mashing, you know, friggin' Option Command Bang Q Ah, uh, you know, but. Uh, the few videos I've seen have been really impressive. But. Well, a friend of mine told me the way you can find a good contractor to do programming is to go to their GitHub repository and see if they're sharing their .vim directory, right? And and look in it and see what are they, what are they so proud of? Exactly. What are you stashing away in there? That's yeah. What what awesomeness have you created in your vim that I don't know about? <laughs> exactly. Right. Windows um, guys can't do that. Windows guys don't have any dot directory of you Crazy. don't have a dot directory. Uh, what you can share is your very cool Visual Studio color theme. Is yours is yours special? <clears throat> no, I think I run. I run. They. I think it ships with like two themes: a light theme and a dark theme. So I have the you know dark background, light colored text thing going on. It worked for me, but uh, yeah, I don't. I don't sit there and mank with the colors of uh, you know different things in Visual Studio. Oddly, I have a few other things to get done. Well, you, you know, the, the way this always works is you spend all that time creating your custom colors, and then somehow it gets trashed, you lose it, and oh, yeah. it's like, crap, did I just spend three days <laughs> <laughs> trying to get this JavaScript right, to look right, exactly the, right? You know, the highlighting on this particular incident to look right. <laughs> no, there's other people with more time than you do, and they'll do a better job. Use theirs. Oh, right. It, totally. I mean, that's the joy of the internet is that there's always somebody who has more time to do. Right. It's just things. a Google search away from not having to do work. <laughs> that's what I. That's exclusively what I try and do. Is just search my way out of all problems. Yeah. So, I we were talking. I don't know if we were talking about this before. I can't remember if we we're talking about this before I got on or not. But it's it's freaking getting hot here in Arizona. Right. And yes. I was telling Dave my air conditioners. Both of them are running full bore right now. I don't know if you can hear them, but. You know, it's costing me money. And actually, I've been thinking about getting those Nest uh, ah. thermostats because, you know, there's got to be a smarter way than this stupid Honeywell, you know, goes on at 8 a.m., goes off. Honeywell on switch for your house, right? On. Yeah, Go. so I was, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, they have, I mean, so I have a smart, sort of a smart meter at my house, right. uh, SRP, and it sort of, I can get on the internet, and I can go, and I can see that, you know, yesterday I used 22 that's kilowatts or whatever. Right on. You know, that's pretty cool, but, like, why are we not, I mean, why are we not integrating some of this stuff more? I mean, people keep talking about this internet of things, right? Yeah, yeah. And they come up with Nest as an example, but are we, do we really have an internet of things yet? I think we're a ways off on it. I think there might be, like, people creeping in from the edges, and it may be that, like, Nest is one of those company is it is kind of coming at it from a different angle like nest's approach to this basically smart grid right so you get smart grid which is creeping out from the power companies out to your you know smart meter and then next is it has to kind of filter into your house so that your appliances can negotiate for power on the market you know spot market for power stuff your fridge can decide when it's going to like you know, consume its power to get itself really cold based on how many times you open it and all kinds of intelligent stuff like this. 
but it's just kind of creeping in from the edges. And I think Nest might be interesting because they're just kind of poking up in the middle and being like, hey, we're here in your house. What can we do? And they're not trying to solve the, you know, that really big problem of let's, let's do a negotiated spot market for power, right? I need three kilowatts right now. Who's going to sell me the best mm-hmm. deal? They're just going to say, well, we know when you're not here. So let's just you know, ratchet it down and you're around at these times. And, you know, I think that's a, a more interesting approach because, um, as you said yesterday, can be very disruptive because it just kind of, it's not coming at it from this edge, edge in approach. But yeah, I mean yeah. the idea that okay, I've got to sit and wait till SRP, my power company, right. puts the special meter, and then it's got they they would put crazy meters on every you know appliance, and it's like it, as you say, it's over engineering the problem because engineers are running it. Versus right. just figure out when I'm around, figure out when you know what what I do. You know, I think I know how I live in this house. Right. But chances are I don't live the way I think I do. <laughs> totally. And yeah, you know, I think that'd be really cool. I like, we just got a uh, smart meter put in. At this point, I don't think it's actually being used. I don't think we can access the the back end of it yet. Um, you know, and they're they're trying to solve that eventual like everybody bid. You know, your appliances bid for power, and your you know your your dishwasher and your washing machine and dryer are totally going to be on the spot market. So you load them up and then they sit there until, you know, the power price has reached a threshold that you wanted. And so it fires up at three in the morning because there's a lot lot less load. Um, So to solve that problem is, you know, a big engineering thing. But I think that, you know, what Nest's approach is as a company, they're going to have presence in your home long before you know, GE is being able to say, hey, I've got like a new dishwasher for you that's going to negotiate on the spot market. That may exist in a lab somewhere, but until all the rest of that crap comes together, they're not going to have presence in your house. Nest is already there. And so they'll be able to grow their thing out because, oh, Nest, no, totally. This is awesome. You know, you buy the Nest adapter for your existing GE uh, dishwasher and slap it on the side and it, it becomes smart. Um, so I think that that's that's my theory. No, and, and I think these things are kind of cool because they're new APIs. I, I don't know if you saw um, any of the FME uh, World Tour last week with no, uh, Dale no. and Don, but um, they have a um, um, uh, what's the the car, the electric car, the Tesla. Uh, Tesla. He's got Tesla S, and they were connecting to the API. Showing where they were driving the car and you know how the battery's working and all this others and you know they programmed you know, they were doing it through FME which was kind of cool yeah but I was like that's that's you know from a nerdy standpoint a GIS standpoint the idea of being able to map this kind of stuff right um, or, or these, even just taking the idea from the nerdy perspective of all your stuff actually has APIs you know I mean it's just stuff that I would like more is like an API for me because as you said you know you think you know how you live in your house I think I know how I sleep but why is it that some days I wake up rested and other days I sleep like crap you know there can be a whole lot of variation but I mean I started using a little like sleep app on this thing which is incredibly informative I mean all it does is just sit there on your bed and figure out if you know you're jiggling around or if you're awake, you're asleep. You're Super simplistic. I got it. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. I I am aware of that. So, <laughs> um, but you know, just this whole idea of like being able to instrument things, and being able to interact with them, and get data out of them, because you think you know a lot of stuff about things around you, but you probably don't. Um, I mean, even if even if you did something as simple as like on your on uh some of these like heavy appliances that use a lot of power, if it just had, okay, you know what, right now the cost of energy is here, and at 3 a.m. it's right here. You know, Would you like to delay this by four hours? Those are the sorts of things that I think are really easy engineering-wise compared to having all these appliances, you know, negotiating on a spot market uh, based on, you know, your preconceived ideas of how much you want to pay. That, Sounds well, like I'm it's looking hard. at getting. Well, I'm looking at getting a new refrigerator, and so you go down. They've got all these fancy refrigerators with the LCD screens. They're all about liking products on Facebook and Pinterest. <laughs> exactly. so you can hold up your your mustard, and it'll scan the the barcode, and then you exactly. can add it to Pinterest. It's like there's value there, man. 
why are they solving that problem? I mean, you were saying, you know, negotiate the spot market. I mean, if you have a pool, a swimming pool, the number one cost is the freaking pump running. Right. Those things are just so stupid. They're like old-fashioned <laughs> pumps, and you know, on. on and it's running full bore, and it's you know, you can see your little thing outside spinning. It's like worse than the. I think it uses more energy than the air conditioner. <laughs> to be honest with you. And I'd love for that thing to sit out there and just be connected to the internet and say, "Oh, we can run for you know two hours right, right. now, shut off, and then take." Yeah, yeah. That's the way you handle those problems. Right. Not can my swimming pool pump like something on on Pinterest or pinned up, <laughs> or solving the opposite problem, which is to say, how can I get a how can I build a pump that's going to last for fifty thousand hours? Like, you don't need to solve that problem. What you need to do is just enable this. Thing to not have to run all the time, um, then you solve your problem. And and I think the display of yeah, I mean if <laughs> that's ridiculous, like oh milk, I like it. It has a freaking camera on it to, to to check the barcode. I mean what? I guess theoretically I, you could order more <laughs> milk and it would come by a I, some sort of cereal. I don't. Know. Right, right. Maybe it has like a door, so you want to back your fridge up to an outside wall. And then there's a backside door that the delivery guy can just magically put new food into your fridge. I mean, yeah, he was I, showing me like you hit this button and then this button, this button, this button, then you can get ice. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's like I want some ice, and it's like why can't I just? There's no like just you know the old. I mean, my one I have right now has two things: ice on this side, water right. on this side. Exactly. Where you go? Right. But no, you got to go. How does this there. need to be like? You know, I need to write some Python to get the fucking ice out, like. You know, this is totally. ridiculous. It was like a seven-step process. It's like, okay, uh, have you not paid attention to anything about these? Like, simple. You know, and Nobody it's a wants a more complex fridge, right? And it's Samsung, too. It's got all these apps. It's got a Pandora app on your door. <laughs> like, I could, I could stream Pandora music through some crazy, crappy speaker. Yeah, exactly. You know, maybe my eggs will be happy. <laughs> they got a little jazz going on. <laughs> That's right. It's, it's freshness music. You know, it's it all keeps this your lettuce crisp. And I, I was there, and this woman comes over, and she goes, "I just got one of these." I'm like, you know, I mean, I would probably wouldn't get one because they're actually very expensive, and I, I don't really care. But I go, "What do you like about it?" She goes, "Well, the great thing about it is at night, like the the LCD screen is on, and like the whole house is like lit up because <laughs> you know it's See, telling you that it's <laughs> five grand on a fridge when you could have just <laughs> turned a light on." It's and it's funny too because you get the ice like crushed ice and you see this ice falling out animation falling out and there's this fan spinning around and it hits the ice and it's like snow and it's it's like these guys spent all this time creating these stupid things and the thing still uses probably uses more energy than my ten year old refrigerator because it's, it's got, got an LCD the... screen that's on all the time lighting your house. <laughs> yeah, seriously. People so I can are, you know but not then. Probably. I can share things on Pinterest, and you can see that, hey, James has got uh, some new cheese in his refrigerator, and he likes it. Exactly. <laughs> that would. I mean, I could see if it was smart, and you, like, totally, you know, trained the thing on all the stuff you have, and it knows, like, the last time you put milk in here was three weeks ago, you know. And it knows, like, hey, you're at Whole Foods. Pick up this because you don't have it. Yeah, hey, okay, that little ecosystem would be good, but it doesn't need... Pinterest or Facebook integration. I mean, that's just goofy. <laughs> it's like this hyper sharing, right? And now I'm having this kind of lettuce. I mean, <laughs> what kind of American cheese does James have today? Exactly. He didn't get the craft. He's a cheap son of a bitch. <laughs> exactly. I got the Kroger version, the Safeway version. Man, so. that's rough. <laughs> but that's but that's what you see these days, or these 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 right. items. Are the just... Internet of Things is an, a relatively stupid set of things right now. It's, a it's not really media. helping. Yeah, right. That's what's driving them, and I don't know. Like, what? how did the focus group for Samsung go with this fridge? Like, what kind of weird people came in there and were like, no, dude, totally it needs a camera, and I need to be able to send pictures to my Instagram account? Oh, well, it's it's <laughs> like people like Glenn, you know? Glenn left them. <laughs> Those are the people they ask, and then, you know, that guy right, loves right. everything. So exactly. He's like, that you know, it would be, be really great. cool. Exactly. Really cool That's if they could tweet, you know, what James is doing, you know. Right. James's refrigerator. I feel cold today. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's just a stream of consciousness from your fridge. Whether it feels ignored, it makes random comments like, you know, 
James seems to be drinking a lot more beer these days. You know? Facebook used to be like that. It used to say like James Fee is, or you know, and it, you'd, you'd say what you were right. doing, not just how it ended up turning into more of a Twitter thing. But yeah, I guess they have this thing now. I saw on Facebook where people can put how they feel. You know, I'm feel. You know, like uh, <laughs> get satisfaction. I'm disturbed. You know, it's right, this unhappy right, thing. Right. I'm agitated. It's the <laughs> so. internet mood ring. Right. Right. My refrigerator is agitated because I keep opening the door. It's trying to cool it down. <laughs> exactly. And now it has to spend all this money on the spot market for power. Oh, Did we that? just totally go off on a tangent here? I think so. I've been attempting to look at what's going on in the IRC, but, you know. Yeah, they're just, they want Facebook <laughs> off, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. See, Glenn doesn't like... Anything, but if it was like a Nokia refrigerator, he'd totally oh, be all over that. He'd be all over that. He'd be like, "I need some of that." Hook me up, right now. So if my refrigerator likes something on Pinterest <laughs> and my dishwasher doesn't like that on Pinterest, <clears throat> how do we reconcile that through APIs? Right, right. I mean, maybe that's the whole thing. Is that then there's probably a printer on the fridge, so that once you've liked something, then a competitor can buy the information that. James has, in fact, switched to Kroger cheese spread, and Kraft will go and print out a, uh, or probably just send it to your phone, you know, like a little, uh, yeah, a little coupon. Coupon, right, a little exactly, coupon. a little coupon. Um, you know. No, and then what if the appliances team up on each other, like refrigerators, it's like, hey, microwave. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> did, you, did, you hear, did you hear what the dishwasher said? <laughs> right, right. And then you're going to get crap like where, you know, your insurance company, your health insurance company is buying into the understanding of what the hell's in your fridge, and they're going to start adjusting your premiums based on the fact that you have too much beer and not enough uh, greenery in there. So it's a slippery slope, my friend. Yeah, and then and then you find out that your refrigerator likes, you know, ice cream. <laughs> exactly. Why is my refrigerator liking ice cream? Right. You know, Especially if it was to like get into like some sort of autonomous food ordering kind of scenario where it just kind of gets off on its own thing. Maybe that's where uh, you know, Skynet really starts is in like rogue refrigerators and general appliances teaming up. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, I use the Amazon order you know the auto order and the subscribe for a couple oh, things right. and okay. and one thing i use always for the the sonic care toothbrush heads i i use sonic care i always those things i never have them when i need it so it yeah. comes every two two months or so right. i've got like 40 of them in my drawer cuz i can't <laughs> <laughs> oh, use them quick enough. It's like right, I, right. So your refrigerator <laughs> keeps ordering milk, and you have a refrigerator full of milk. <laughs> exactly. Stop <laughs> ordering the milk, <laughs> damn it. Exactly. It gets all rogue. Yeah, it's like, you know, I was dating this some, a friend of mine who, well, I guess she's more than a friend, but she, <laughs> she was allergic to grapes. It's like, can, she, can my refrigerator know through her Facebook that she doesn't like grapes and you know, it knows. It's kind of, hey, it's kind of too, yeah. I mean, if you're if, coming over, don't get rid of those yeah, grapes. Get rid of those grapes. I mean, that might be you know relatively smart on that side, but it would seem to me it's kind of like, well, once it gets in the fridge, it's a little too late. Yeah, but there's always that thing in the back of the refrigerator. You're like, you forgot about, and then you move like the pickles, and you're like, <laughs> oh, oh, I totally don't want to open this right, thing because right. you know, you know that cream cheese is such 2010. Exactly. Oh, what's <laughs> It's a total experiment. You know, you sort of want to peek because you want to see how bad it looks, but then right. you're just like... How did this go? And then you open it up and it doesn't look messed up, and then you're like, oh, God, I should never yeah. eat that again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like things that turn colors because then you can tell. Otherwise, right, exactly. bam. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. people think we should have our own talk show. <laughs> I think we've wasted enough of everybody's time for a while. Yeah, boy, it's just... <laughs> This went from talking about GIS programming to... To fridges and grid and I don't know, all kinds of good stuff. Right, we have to set up, a uh, not a geofence, a... Uh, what, are they, what, are they, what does we call them now? Not geo Geotriggers. Geotriggers. Yeah, exactly. A geotrigger knows when I pull the salsa out of my refrigerator, it knows to alert me yeah, that the yeah. chips are in the pantry. Well, you could do that. I mean, theoretically, right, if they started putting RFID chips into pretty much everything... Um, you could know when stuff comes out of your fridge, but then there's the whole other side of like, well, if you want to eat well, uh, what you're eating shouldn't come in a package, so you're stuck in this weird dichotomy between, <laughs> I want to know what I have, but <laughs> I don't want to eat bad food, so I 
am putting RFIDs into my food. I don't know. But like the refrigerator makes a work. bad sound when you pull it, like the sad trombone sound. <laughs> wah, 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 when you pull wah, it. Wah, wah. That's your third beer today, James. <laughs> Use up, buddy. Right? You know, like, you know, try the Michelob. <laughs> yeah, that's a Michelob Ultra. I could have four of these. Before. Exactly, right? It can make it can make recommendations. And plus Ease you gotta have the four, fat tire, right? You gotta have four Michelob Ultras before you can actually enjoy them anyway. So <laughs> this is an issue. Totally. <laughs> awesome. All right. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for <laughs> joining us, especially at the end, even though we don't know what right. we're talking about. Right, uh, right. Rambling. Steve Coast will join me next week. We're going to talk about the GPS uh, maps that he created on Kickstarter. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. Wacky. That's that's some pretty cool stuff. The actual like physical physical things I think are kind of cool. You yeah. Work it, in such a abstract digital realm all the time. Something that comes out of that and gets made physical is kind of cool. Yeah, so he, uh, we'll see. Apparently people have come up with weird ways to describe the area that they want the map of. Ah, so he has to try and figure out the area. But, you know, I send him a bounding box. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, that's what he should be doing is having, here's the API, drag a box. I should have I should have done it in state plane and send him state plane coordinates instead of <laughs> just, that long, yeah. just to screw right. it up, see if he could use it. Them. You know, right. but other people do, you know, the house down by the big park next to the river. And right. it's interesting. The, you know, you think about that happens in the third world, but it happens here. So, yeah, totally. So it'll be good to you. So, all right, man. Um, are you going to be uh, going to San Diego this summer? Or are you way outside of that? Maybe. I mean, technically, I'm not a customer right now. Uh, right. Though, actually, my son has a copy of ArcGIS for Home. So, close enough. He's got all the fancy extensions, and I don't. Right. Um, cruel, cruel. Right? He's got Network Analyst in that other room, right right over, well, wait, right, right. Like back this way. Right. You know, rocking, I could, rocking some Network Analyst, really working out how to get to the... Basement. Well, it, the Arizona Department of Education signed, like, a K-12 through awesome. agreement, so they all have access to the stuff now. And That's I thought, well, cool. if he's got it at school, <laughs> might as well have a copy at home. Totally. Being the nerdy right. that I am. But I might be there. I'll be up at State of the Map. You going to State of the Map? No, you know, and it's a little bit outside of my bailiwick too. Yeah, no, you're just, you're not as hip as you could be. This is very true. I don't know. We are going to be doing some stuff with Node. Maybe that'll pump my pump my hipness. I'll be at uh, Jazz in the Rockies keynoting that. Ah, well, that is just down the road, and I'm sure we'll be there in some capacity. So, if just a drink after the show, right? There you are. I'll co I'll come hear you talk. You're always you're always entertaining. So. Oh yeah, now I got to come up with the subject matter to talk about. God, Actually, God. I will be I'll be at a conference tomorrow and and Friday. At, it's a surveyors conference oh. here in Arizona, the state surveyors, and it's actually uh, talking about crowdsourcing to surveyors. I'll see how they they like that. <laughs> really? Yeah, I don't think they're going to be awesome. too. Uh, I don't think they're going to be too open to the idea that anybody can create roads. Just go and correct create this data. Right, right. That, yeah, also, uh, yeah, well, good luck with that. Yeah, I was thinking I should hire somebody to, to I could sell like rotten tomatoes on the side and make some money. You could. I, I kind of get this like mental picture of uh, the Blues Brothers when they go to that country bar and everybody's throwing shit at them and they got like that chicken screen, chicken, <laughs> chicken wire down. And they only know rawhide. They say rawhide it. 40 times. Right. Rawhide all night long. Exactly. Oh, goodness. So, that's yeah. me. You going anywhere? You got, or are you just uh, chilling? I'm, I'm hunkered down. Um, you know, we're, we're doing this round of hiring. We're doing a bunch of product development and a bunch of interesting research stuff. So uh, I'm locked in, I think. Uh, till San Diego, which is cool, because wow. I get to do a whole bunch of uh, you know hanging out at home, mountain biking, that kind of fun stuff. Apparently, still snowboarding for some reason. <clears throat> Dude, it just won't stop. Although I think now theoretically we're done. Right, yesterday's snowstorm or the day before a snowstorm was that's the end of it. But that's the theory. Yeah, we don't. I, as I said, I got air conditioners blowing away. Right you don't here. have that issue. <laughs> it's actually. I mean, it's pretty nice here today. I don't know. There's still snow around. I can see the reflection in your little window there behind you. Yes, so you can see there's some snow. I see a white truck. Yes, there is a white truck. And there, was a, there was a white van that kept driving by, too. That <laughs> was there thinking. really? So. It's the reflection on the reflection stuff. So yeah. Um, <laughs> all right, got to wrap this up. We're killing yeah, it. Yeah, it'll go on forever. Everybody, right. have a great week. Dave, take care, yeah. and Thanks thank you a lot, very man. much. Yeah, take Bye. care.